The next presentation in the Lead Marketing Conference deals with achieving better ROI with integrated promotions. Our speaker is Art Klebanov, VP of Professional Services for Clear Demand. Art, you have a wonderful background, a very rich background, so take it away. Well, thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Art Klebanov. I, am, uh, I lead up the services group uh, at Clear Demand. Um, I've been working with uh, retailers and manufacturers for the past 15 years. Um, you know, everyone from do-it-yourself uh, retailers such as Home Depot to some of the big box stores like Best Buy and uh, Target. And um, there have been a number of great presentations today uh, discussing some very rel timely and relevant topics, and we hope to, uh, to contribute to that discussion. We understand um, – oh, also, I want to do it, you know, that uh, – Joining me today is my esteemed colleague, uh, Ryan Jensen. He's our head of marketing, um, and we're going to be, well, he's going to be co-presenting. You want to say hi, Ryan? Hey, thanks for letting me tag along, Art, and uh, we look forward to uh, the conversation and the presentation with everyone. Not a problem. So we understand that the majority of our audience is coming from a CPG or retail background, so we wanted to focus our conversation on a topic that plays a very critical role in your, in your jobs, which is promotions. Um, I want to start, before we get going, I want to start off with a recent shopping experience that I believe illustrates some of the challenges around the current retail landscape um, as it relates to promotions. So, so here's kind of the scenario. Um, you know, New Year's is coming up. I've got a New Year's resolution to, to take up running, and um, I wanted to get some new uh, Nike running shirts. So I was looking around online, and uh, some of the you know, the big uh, sporting goods stores such as Dick's, and I found that the suggested retail price was around $65, um, which is what they normally sell for. Now, during that week, I also noticed that a local outlet store had a Nike shirt that I liked for 20% off. So now, from 65 the shirt is now priced at 52 so it's a $13 discount. But in addition to that, I also had a $10 coupon from filling out a survey the last time I was in the store taking the price down to $42. Um, I also paid for uh, gift cards that I bought at a local grocery store, which gave me $10 off groceries if I purchased a $50 Nike gift card. So giving that purchase a fair share of the savings, that's an extra $5 off, taking the price of the shirt to $37. And, of course, I paid for the gift card with my you know, MasterCard, so 2% cash back, that's an extra $0.74 cents savings, taking the price down to roughly $36. So in the end, I get a $65 shirt for $36.26 or a 55.7% discount. Not bad, right? I got a great deal. But was this the experience that Nike had intended? Consumers are sharp and educated, and they have no qualms piecing together a patchwork of coupon codes, cards, loyalty programs, to craft a deal that might not have been foreseen by retailers, nor would likely be profitable for them. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thank you, Art. See, the truth of the matter is that promotions, while essential to retail, are incredibly complex. Anything from 25% off an entire department with an additional 10% off for, for an individual item within that department, then you have the mini coupons and redeemable loyalty points. These types of stacked promotions are not uncommon. When, do, when done right, they drive loyalty and profit, but more often than, they, than not, they fail to generate a positive impact on the bottom line. Worse yet, many retailers or manufacturers don't have enough visibility into the sales or to be able to properly diagnose what is or is not working. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I suspect that many of you have stories or even scars from promotions that did not perform as expected. This shouldn't be as painful if the stakes weren't so high. This wouldn't be as painful if the stakes weren't as high. For a typical CPG company, retail trade promotions are the largest area of spend after cost of goods sold. CPG trade budgets fund virtually all of the discounts offered by retailers and are one of the key tools available to manufacturers seeking to grow volume and share. In fact, in 2015, Gartner released a study that found that discounts and promotions represented upwards of 25% of revenue for a typical CPG. This equates to hundreds of billions of dollars when you spread it across the U.S. So over time, promotions train consumers to buy only when there's a sale, and each new round of discounts must be deeper than the last in order to get and maintain their attention. 
you probably all have experience with the promotions that Art explained or experience with things like buy one, get one, 50% off, or buy one suit, get three for free. In short, the overuse of these promotions can become an addictive behavior that can, only deep, that can deeply damage a company's brand identity. Yet, a drastic change to eliminate promotions is not the answer. Witness JCPenney's attempt in early 2012 to purge the word sale from its marketing playbook in favor of everyday low pricing. I think we're all aware of what happened there. The bottom line is that there are opportunities every day for retailers and manufacturers to make more money. But before we start to prescribe solutions, it's important for us to understand the myriad reasons that contribute to unsuccessful promotions. As I mentioned earlier, there's a fair amount of complexity involved in executing these. I think it's important that we start here. Ideally, I'm going to walk through the ideal scenario and identify the key players. So in an ideal or perfect world, the promotion planning process is agreed upon and well executed by several key stakeholders. This slide that I'm presenting now is an oversimplified representation, but I believe all of you get the point. Like a good jazz band, all elements should blend together seamlessly, with flexibility and responsibility being critical, and everyone should be working towards the same goal. What is that goal for retailers? According to a recent Bain study, a promotion should accomplish four things. First, it should spur strategic innovation. Second, it should strengthen a brand's image. Third, it should create happier and more loyal customers. And fourth, it should grow long-term sales and profits. These goals are best achieved when everyone knows and executes their roles. The merchandising team will work with the manufacturer to determine product strategies. Over here you have the pricing and promotion teams and they'll identify the ideal price points and promotions to run. The store operations group will execute the promotion and provide critical feedback to all responsible parties. And the supply chain group will ensure that throughput is maximized by pushing inventory to the right stores, in the right amounts, and at the right times. In theory, this makes a lot of sense and seems relatively simple, but as you are all aware, there are so many possible complications that need to be considered in order to ensure things work this smoothly. Let's highlight some of the biggest obstacles. Art, I'm going to turn it back over to you. This list is by no means exhaustive, but it contains the biggest challenges that need to be addressed. Some are organizational. For example, different groups within the organization might have competing goals or variable compensation or bonus structures that can create conflict. Others negatively impact the team's ability to operate effectively. Let's quickly discuss the four that we highlight. So starting from left to right, first is data. Despite best efforts, it can still be inaccurate, incomplete, and difficult to obtain. For example, point of sale data, you know, getting the right product and location hierarchy, competitive data, zones, and so on. What compounds this problem is the general lack of integration that still exists, namely with the systems used to plan and execute the promotions. We've all had the experience with customers that have had teams operating from different forecasts that are generated by different disparate systems. There are critical disconnects in the planning process that we're all aware of. Merchandising has its forecast for base demand and expected lift. The manufacturer always has their forecast, while the supply chain has their version. Seldom will these align or be integrated with stable store label forecasts, resulting in mismatches between plans and execution that can rob promotions of their effectiveness. To make matters worse, many organizations continue to be plagued by manual and outdated processes. That means slinging spreadsheets back and forth. Many times this is done because groups have lost faith in systems that were supposed to address the first two obstacles. We found that even with companies that have purchased more sophisticated solutions, these are either not fully utilized or abandoned due to their complexity to manage the proverbial black box. And finally, there's a general over-reliance on last year's. We call it, some of us call it last year-itis. Um, using last year's performance to dictate direction in the present. For example, items that were on the front page of a flyer last year are again selected for that prime real estate based on last year's performance. Of course, that assumes you have the same mix of items in the ad. The retail environment is dynamic, and you need to keep up with the changes. Simply relying on past performance of products and stores alone is not a reliable method to forecast the financial impact of promotional event or events for the following reasons. Seasonality isn't necessarily the same. How do you handle changes in trends? So for example, 
And you have changes in uh, consumer tastes like gluten-free or low-carb products. Shifting holiday calendars and events will further change seasonality and demand. New products, stores, and categories that have no sales history. How do you come up with a forecast when you have a new item? Effect on new product introductions or existing products? How does that capture? How do you account for cannibalization? How do you account for changes in promotional frequency and depth of discount? Or introductions of private label? How does that interact with national brands, making sure that the store brands prices are protected and don't give up margin. There are many obstacles that are probably documented in your head. We're interested in what you think are the biggest challenges you're facing. Let's pause for a moment and introduce a quick poll question to get your feedback. Okay, the question is, what do you see as the biggest obstacle for retailers and manufacturers in developing mutually beneficial promotions? Please select your answer and hit submit. The answers are coming up. Anything that surprises you with that, Art? No, it's data quality and um, inability to determine effectiveness are popping up, which is not surprising. That's almost half, half of the respondents. Yeah, yeah. That seems to fall in line with what we're kind of thinking here as well. All right, let's advance the conversation here. So up to this point, things have been looking a little grim. Now that we've identified the key issues, let's change gears and focus on solutions. We all agree that promotions are essential to both retailers and manufacturers. We also agree that there is room for improvement. So now for the rest of our time, let's focus on key actions that retailers and CPG companies can take in order to get more value out of your integrated promotions. Advance the slide. So this list isn't uh, in all-inclusive or exhaustive, but it contains three key elements that, in our opinion, have the greatest ability to create improvements in your promotional efforts. We consider these elements foundational to success, and without these adequately addressed, you'll not be able to engage in the more advanced activities like personalized promotions. We will start by highlighting the changes that can be made at the organizational level. You cannot advance the next to the next two areas unless you have the right people in place with the right tools and are directed towards the correct and agreed upon strategic goals. From there, we will highlight the tremendous impact that can be generated through an investment in retail science. And finally, we'll demonstrate the importance of ensuring visibility in your efforts and creating a culture of measurement around the right activity. So let's proceed to the first point. First things first, all participating parties need to have a clear understanding of what the specific promotion is trying to accomplish. For many retailers, the promotion process is heavily focused on implementation and execution rather than strategy. Many retailers lack a clear goal for their promotions, or they just want to drive sales and traffic on certain items but lose sight of opportunities to gain additional trade funds to offset their investment in the promotion. There are a number of different objectives for promotions, and we list a few here for reference. They can be used to drive traffic through aggressive price re reductions. You can combine products in an offer, for example, bundles, to have a strong product help create a halo effect around products in which you're trying to generate traction or even drive bigger baskets. While this is more of a clearance problem, you could be simply looking to run a promotion to move some items that are underperforming. These strategies can be used in different scenarios and can create different outcomes depending on intent. The bottom line is that you should be all aware of the strategy behind the promotion and the activities needed to support it. Otherwise, you run the risk of neg negatively impacting your efforts. Let's take another quick pause and introduce a poll question around strategy, specifically around your most recent efforts. We'll give you a few moments to respond. What was your, last, what was your top priority on the last promotion that you executed? Please select your answer and hit submit. So driving traffic and building baskets, which is not surprising. Uh, 
I'm a little surprised that uh, nobody's done anything around loyalty or price image. Actually, we're going to actually address price image in uh, some subsequent slides. So maybe that's a good plug for getting people to actually run a campaign that emphasizes that. All right, let's move to the uh, second component around strategy and alignment. Agreeing upon strategy is one thing. Do you have the right structure in place and able to enable that strategy to su succeed? That's a whole other. For the sake of this conversation, we are talking specifically about systems integration. Many companies house their trade, revenue, and promotion information in different locations with disparate, incongruent technologies. Retailers and CPG companies alike often rely on unrelated ERP, CRM solutions, even external spreadsheets, which force them to rely on manual updates or interventions for things like sending files via email. Because of the attention these disparate systems demand, any pricing changes require a long and manual effort. For example, you have transaction data stored in a data warehouse, other data in access database, spreadsheets, or an ERP system, and merging them all together in a meaningful way can be quite the challenge. Nowhere is this more important than in forecast accuracy. As we mentioned earlier, it is not uncommon for different groups within a company to be operating off of different forecasts. How do you plan at reconciling the differences? At the very least, integration creates a single source of truth. I don't want to speak about this lightly, as I'm sure many of you within large enterprises have large solutions that permeate your entire value chain, and your IT teams have probably logged many countless hours in getting the systems to successfully communicate with each other. And this level of effort is justified as you simply cannot execute integrated promotions without the ability for things like forecasts to be shared across systems. There's a lot more that could be shared about this topic, but I'm positive that you all have very smart people within your organizations who are looking to provide the solutions here. So I'm going to advance the narrative and focus our efforts on an area that is near and dear to my heart and the heart of many colleagues at Clear Demand, namely retail science. Art, back to you. Setting the right price for your product is difficult. As a matter of fact, determining the price is one of the most important as well as underutilized um, levers in your, the four P's of marketing, in large part because merchants and manufacturers are starved for time. Um, some merchants that we've met only have a few hours a week dedicated to pricing. Retailers and manufacturers track historical price in determining future demand or price elasticity. However, price is just one variable. You need retail science to be able to account for all the sources of noise that's often found in the data. So, and we've mentioned some of these before, such as seasonality, uh, changes in your store count, openings, closings, assortment, changes, cannibalization, and affinity. This is a core activity at Clear Demand, where a dedicated team of data scientists contend with understanding these demand influencing factors and how they relate to one another as well as the impact on units, revenue, and profit. The case for retail science is well established and the serial example on the next slide is just one data point that illustrates the positive results generated when you price more closely changes in demand. We can't state strongly enough the profit lift that can be achieved by knowing which products respond most favorably to promotions. Conversely, it usually makes little sense to promote items that might be considered inelastic and where a promotion would not generate enough lift to compensate for the loss in margin. The use cases for demand modeling can be expanded to come up with better ways to understand and influence shopping behavior of customer segments and your most loyal shoppers. And one area where understanding consumer demand really pays off is in the realm of forecast accuracy. Forecast accuracy is paramount if you want to minimize, for example, out of stock, or more importantly, measure the incremental lift associated with TPRs and other types of offers that are out there like BOGOs, buy one, get one, buy one, get one half off, or bundles. Ideally, you want to be able to forecast down to the store level so that you can truly match product with a demand for each local market. 
A key challenge is determining what you would have sold had that item not been on promotion, i.e., or sold at the regular price. It's not enough to just look at total sales. You have to understand your historical demand, uh, relying on accurate demand models, and measure the effect of each demand influencing factor, such as price, placement in the ad, display, offer type, seasonality. The chart on the right is an example of actual promotions run by a grocery customer. As you can see, by providing accurate SKU store day forecasts, we were able to isolate the baseline volume shown in blue, and, that's been, and it accounts for seasonality, as well as measuring the incremental lift due to the promotional events. You also need the ability to accurately account for out of stock. At Clear Demand, we have a patented probabilistic approach to finding out when an item is truly out of stock versus being available and just simply having zero sales on that day. This is especially important when you're talking about items in the tail or slower moving SKUs. In the chart on the right, you can see sales versus the demand forecast as the lost opportunity due to the product not being available on the shelf. Conversely, what if you order too much and have to bear inventory holding costs? For categories in, let's say, the produce department, this can be detrimental due to shrinkage. Moving on to optimization. So, demand modeling by itself is valuable, but it needs to be directed by your strategy, and it needs to be responsive to any constraints or business rules. With respect to strategy, it is important to conduct what-if analysis and explore possible differences in margin and traffic based on your particular strategy. To look for a solution that allows you to explore this and other scenarios when you're planning your promotional activities. With respect to rules, retailers have them for a reason, and they're critical in maintaining consistent price image and competitive positioning. For example, if your demand model suggests that you raise the price of your five-ounce yogurt or lower the price, it doesn't make sense to um, if your customers have similar products that are larger size but yet are priced higher on a per unit basis. Rules provide guards against these kinds of inconsistencies. In the context of promotions, suppose you know that a strawberry Yoplait 5.3 ounce yogurt drives units and drags along other complementary items such as granola. You may not need to promote the entire line, thus saving your margins. In the chart on the right, the retailer is segmenting their item candidates in the traffic drivers on the left and margin enhancers on the right, looking for opportunities. But what about the overall category goal? You need optimization to align your promotions with your goals and objectives. Let's move on to the final area, visibility and measurement. Ryan? Thanks, Art, on the home stretch. You need to be able to ensure that you can properly measure all of the most relevant activities that impact promotional performance. As an example, you should evaluate incremental sales and not just actual sales. This will allow you to peel back the onion a bit and get a more complete view of the effectiveness of your promotions. And here um, we have an illustration of just doing just that. Earlier we explained how retail science can model for things like affinity, cannibalization, and pantry loading. It is important now for you to be able to account for these factors when reporting on how well the promotion works so that you get a more complete picture. Let's use this chart as an example. A retailer should first determine the baseline sales that it would have realized without running the promotion. Then the retailer should identify the incremental sales that were generated during the promotion. The analysis then requires factoring in the discounts, the supplier funding, the cannibalization, or the sales that the promoted items took away from similar products, the complementar complementarity, as well as the stock ups, or which is the loss of future sales at full price because customers pantry load. You also have to consider advertising costs and supply chain expenses, such as incremental freight or distribution. Then finally, you need to account for store costs, such as employee time, time dedicated to uh, helping run and stock and uh, maintain things at a store level. Once you account for all of this, it will give you a truer picture of performance. And once you identify the right things to measure, we come to our last point. You will want to be able to ensure that you are able to obtain the visibility needed to conduct analysis at a more detailed or granular level. I'm going to pass it over to Art to take it away. Thanks, Ryan. 
as we move along the journey <clears throat> to things like personalized promotions, it's not enough to just look at demand at national or even zone level. Market demand for certain products varies greatly depending on location and characteristics of a particular store. For example, proximity to certain competitors, store traits, customer demographics, household penetration for your brand. You need to have a tool or strategy that enables you to get a more granular analysis of promotions so that you can truly meet demand at the store level. In this example, the red areas are opportunities to improve the promotional lift as measured by the incremental lift percentage due to the level of discount. Too many retailers measure general lift from a sale but aren't able to or don't take the time to see if there are certain factors like price, geography, or offer type that might be more meaningful for one product over another. It's not enough to just measure lift for a promotion. You need to know what percentage of that lift is attributed to the specific offer, ad, or display. In the past, this type of granular, granular analysis was a real challenge as you are likely limited to basic sales information and some syndicated data from Nielsen or IRI. Now, there's no shortage of data points, nor real limits to how fast you can receive them. By selecting the right data and creating the right measures, you can now effectively analyze and optimize at a local level. Go ahead, Ryan. All right, thanks, Art. Companies that make the necessary effort in these three areas see tangible improvements in the ROI of their promotions. It also generates positive momentum as they become more adept at leveraging the power of data analysis. You're probably well aware of this framework that was introduced over 10 years ago in the seminal book, Competing on Analytics. It serves as a guide and a measuring stick for companies as they look to differentiate themselves from the competition by taking a more analytical and data-driven approach to all aspects of their business. What we shared about retail science is a very effective way in which you can respond to consumer demand while still supporting your strategic and profit goals. You'll notice that companies in the analytically impaired or even localized analytic stages of development are likely hampered by the same obstacles that we outlined earlier in the presentation. They likely have difficulties even getting to the data, let alone analyzing it, and they probably struggle in discovering insights and creating the necessary speed and scale in order to drive profitable change across the organization. Alternatively, organizations in the analytical competitor stage in, in analytics likely use sophisticated experiments to measure the overall impact or lift of intervention strategies and then apply the results to continuously approve in subsequent analyses. Fortunately for retailers and manufacturers, there are many levers within a typical promotion that can be tested or optimized and can fit into this framework. We are going to now share a couple of case studies that outline how we are able to leverage some of the keys that we outlined today in helping retailers advance in their analytical journey and create a more impactful environment in which to run promotions and ultimately generate meaningful results for their bottom line and for their customers. So Art, it's all yours. But first we have another poll. Oh, I think we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. What stage do you feel your organization is in on the analytical maturity continuum? Mark your selection and please hit submit. We have a nice mix, but a clear winner. All right. Thanks, John. So moving on to the case studies. Okay, so I'm going to share with you two case studies. One is a Tier 1 grocer, and the other is a, um, is a specialty grocer. So starting off with a Tier 1 grocer, this retailer, um, and this is, again, sort of in line with what we had discussed previously, they're relying on stores for forecasts. Offering, ordering, often ordering too much or too little, leading to stockouts and frustrated consumers. In addition, they have multiple promotion types, like weekly flyers, hot sales, that had little or no ideas to the effect these had on actual incremental volume lift. Lastly, they were kind of stuck in that, let's do what we did last year because we need to hit the same number mentality. Um, and different category managers were jockeying for prime real estate in the ad, looking at last year um, 
as justification or rationale. So we'd work with this retailer to, um, the key activities were to localize their promotion by offering SKU store daily forecasts, helping them maximize their ROI on vendor funding by doing what-if analyses, plugging in different discount or cost, discounts on costs, and seeing what the incremental impact is to the bottom line, and using our SKU store daily forecast for ordering, therefore minimizing out of stock while driving traffic and incremental sales. Now, the outcome was improved price image, because we were able to be very competitive on the key value items, optimize promotional offers and vendor deals, and improved forecast accuracy. Our second case study with a specialty grocer, this retailer was in need of one version of the truth. Some of the complexities or challenges that they were facing is they're trying to launch a new loyalty program while at the same time generating personalized offers. And there was a lack of integration across or within their internal organizations. You had finance, marketing, merchandising, all coming up with their forecasts, but there was, they needed a way to bring it all together. So we at Clear Demand helped this retailer develop integrated forecasts that not only um, gave them visibility into the incremental effect lift of their promotions, but also uh, taking into account the items that sold at regular price. They were able to perform what-if analysis and, and measure that incremental lift to, tr to drive traffic and build their brand, and then also generate offers by different customer segments, taking them, moving them further along that journey that Ryan had described in previous slides. And the outcome is they replaced multiple reports with a single source of the truth. They were able to optimize and localize their promotional offers and vendor deals and greatly improve forecast accuracy. So in conclusion, we've kept the conversation at a very high level today, and this was done deliberately. You need to do this fundamental blocking and tackling before you can move on to the sort of more exciting, if you will, complex activities like personalized pricing. We've covered some of the challenges and opportunities associated with running effective promotions. We have prescribed some key activities that can improve ROI with one being the importance of retail science and accurate forecast down to the store SKU day level. We've provided examples of customers who have been able to leverage some of the key things that we've discussed as they advanced along the continuum of analytical pr proficiency. And lastly, we wanted to end with machine learning as, as an additional capability. Um, by leveraging the, the power or harnessing the potential of machine learning, the speed and accuracy with which retailers can plan effective promotion, do their what-if analysis, make sure that the data is accurate, timely, and being captured and used in reporting, and their analytics um, can take them to the next level. This is a visionary slide slide, but many companies, including Clear Demand, are actively working in this realm. In our future presentations, in future presentations, we hope to share examples of how this is used. We appreciate your attendance and your interest in evaluating ways that you can increase the ROI from your promotions. Let's now turn the time over to you for some Q and A. And Art, we do have some questions that uh, we can pose to you folks right now, you and Ryan. The first one okay. being, what is the best way to match consumer demand with inventory allocation so that you don't run into out-of-stock situations? Great question, John. So as we had mentioned, um, when, you're, when you're allocating inventory and uh, limit, trying to prevent or minimize out-of-stock, this is where you know, we highlight the importance of demand modeling, looking at your historical sales and measuring the um, sort of the out of stock rate versus the item not being available on the shelf or, or just not selling that day. So it's, it's leveraging retail science. Okay. 
The next question we have here, are you able to calculate whether or not your promotion has cannibalized sales from some of your non-promoted items? That's an interesting question. Great question. So the answer is yes. By using um, demand modeling, modeling historical sales from your items that are going to be promoted and those that are not, we uh, capture cannibalization through a cross elasticity. And, we're able, and by using product attributes, we're able to group products that are similar, and then we're able to measure demand transference when one item is promoted. Okay, and our last question. Uh, under what circumstances is it unwise to run a promotion? Well, as we talked about, that's a great question. So as we talked about you know, in the previous slides, Training consumers to buy on promotion can undermine your profit and leave money on the table. So, you know, if you've been promoting with, with a high degree of frequency and uh, you've trained your, you know, I think Ryan brought up the, the example where you walk in and you, get, you buy one suit and get two free. If the customer is expecting that, you may want to think about changing your strategy. Okay, excellent. And on the screen, you'll see Art's contact information should uh, any of the audience have further questions. Uh, so thank you both, Ryan and Art. That was excellent. And uh, we look forward perhaps to uh, hearing from you in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John.